and we're live. Hello, everybody. My name is Stan Stalnaker. I'm the founding director of Hub Culture, and we are at the Horasis annual meeting with a focus on America. This panel, this discussion, is around digitization as a gateway to America's future. We all know that digitization is emerging as one of the most important technologies with the potential to transform not only post-COVID society, but the general economy and, and even industries. Which sectors, products, and related investments may yield the best results for commerce and humankind? What are the checks and balances that we need to deploy as we look at deploying these new digitization strategies in our economy? Joining us today is a really fantastic panel of people to kind of dive deep into these topics, ranging from AI to cybersecurity. And they're Joe Herkin, who's the Chief Executive Officer of ISU, who couldn't make it with us today, but will be joining us, I think, for the Q&A later. Manish Kothari, who's the Managing Director and Founder of First Spark Ventures. Mark Minovich, who's the founder of Going Global Ventures. Chris Painter, who's the president of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise Foundation. And Mackenzie Slaughter, the founder and chief executive of Pro House Capital, which is doing DAOs. We're going to kick it off with a little uh, summary and introduction for what each of you guys do, beginning with Chris. Hey, well, thanks very much. Uh, so as we said, I'm Chris Painter. Uh, I have been involved in cybersecurity issues, so in cyber issues for about 32 years now. Uh, first as a, a federal prosecutor who prosecuted uh, big cyber crime cases, then as a senior official at the Justice Department, uh, uh, the White House, uh, and then finally our the U.S.'s top cyber diplomat, first cyber diplomat, uh, and now still uh, work in these areas of, of cybersecurity. And, and the connection, I think, this panel is for all the promise we have of digitization, if we don't think about the security elements and the various threats we're facing, we're not going to achieve all those lofty goals. Okay, we're going to dive more into the cybersecurity issues in a few minutes. Let's go to Mark for a brief introduction. Thank you very much. Um, very much looking forward to being on this panel uh, today. And um, uh, I'm excited uh, to discuss uh, some um, outstanding issues about um, AI and digitalization and what this country uh, needs to do. My, as, uh, as Stan mentioned, I'm the chair of the executive committee of AI for Good. I'm the president of Going Global Ventures. I'm also the chief digital strategist of the International Research Center for Artificial Intelligence under UNESCO. And I serve on a number of different advisory boards uh, including also a member of the World Economic Forum uh, Futures Council and a private investor in digital companies. And again, Stan, I agree. I think digitalization is an unstoppable tool for rapid scaling and increasing profitability uh, for our country. We see what's already happening with the largest market capitalization from mix of technology companies, including energy and retail, Microsoft, the GE, Cisco, Exxon, all digitally driven. Uh, we see it now, obviously, with the players like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, um, uh, Alphabet, Facebook, all are digital, focusing many of them on AI, on, on AI. And as we have seen, Satya Nadella said, we have seen in two years worth of digital transformation now in two months. So we're in a stage in the United States transforming our economy to become more digital, more cognitive, more AI driven. I'm glad to be part of this conversation. We're going to go more into the changes that have been accelerated from COVID and the pandemic and how the landscape looks different uh, as well. Let's go on to Mackenzie. Hello, everyone. I'm Mackenzie Slaughter. I'm the founder and CEO of Pro House Capital. We are a private investment firm. Uh, we focus on buying and building um, digital, financial, and real assets to help um, advance um, decentralized finance in tandem with Web3 and DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. My background is in uh, financial innovation. Um, for the past decade or so, I've been working to build uh, resilient financial infrastructures across the Caribbean, um, Africa, and the diaspora, US mainly. Um, and our focus has been to build um, equitable digital economies so um, in some of these um, uh, um, communities that I work in, some of them are unbanked, some of them are overbanked, um, and they're also trying to build up their startup ecosystem, their tech ecosystem. Um, and they're trying to do that without uh, substantial financial infrastructure, so they can't do remittances, they can't commerce. And so I'll be um, shedding some light on that today on how digitalization of finance um, through decentralized finance 
uh, is um, a, a great gateway for America's future. And also um, share a little bit about Web3 and how that's different from Web2 and how we are, um, how the user is being more empowered with their own data and, um, and, and ownership. Thank and you. Thank you. And one of the people funding these new technologies that are driving blockchain and the world of decentralization is uh, Manish from First Spark. Hi, every hi everybody. I'm, I'm Manish Kari. I'm the founder and managing director for Spark Capital uh, Ventures, a, a, fund, a re new fund recently formed in partnership with Eric Schmidt from Google, ex-CEO Google, uh, focused solely investing in deep, deep tech, uh, pushing the boundaries on what's possible. Uh, my background before that was I was the president of SRI International, a $500 million research nonprofit, which has been around for quite some time. You know, Nuance, Intuitive Surgical, Siri, uh, all came from us and amongst others. And my background also includes a lot of work, both in education, but also in med tech. So um, ranging back from 25 years, and that's an area that most definitely is starting to see the beginnings of the transformation and is well along the path, I think, in the next 10 to 15 years to totally transforming itself. Thank you, Manish. So to summarize for our audience, we have a really wide-ranging panel of expertise in the technology world, ranging from Chris on cybersecurity, from Mark on AI, from Mackenzie on DeFi and centralization, and from Manish on venture investing, and uh, really the digitization of healthcare, really big topics. We're going to go back now to Chris for a moment, and let's talk about something that's extremely timely, which is cybersecurity in an age of armed conflict. We are in uh, an unprecedented state right now, the first land war in Europe since 1945 underway, and we were talking earlier about some of the things that we haven't seen. Um, the The protection of America's critical infrastructure is resting largely on our efforts in cybersecurity. Can you give us a quick overview of how that's looking? Sure. And, and for, in part, what all the other panelists are doing, and I, and I certainly applaud the, the growth of digitization, the, the reliance of almost everyone in the U.S. and around the world on these systems uh, for, for banking, for critical infrastructure, for everything else, we also, also what comes with that is vulnerability. And, and I think the U.S. is often the most vulnerable country in the world because we're most dependent on these. And, you know, for better or worse and largely for worse, as we've had these great innovations, we haven't really thought about security as a building block uh, as we're moving that in. We haven't built it in. And, and I think now we're trying to take care of that after the fact, and that doesn't work very well. Uh, so what that means is we're vulnerable. And then we're vulnerable to criminal actors. We're also vulnerable to nation state actors. And every year, one of the top nation state actors, not surprising probably to anyone, is Russia. As a top nation state actor, a malicious nation state actor, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, but Russia and China at the top of the game. And our director of national intelligence says that every year. So you, so you have dedicated actors who, in Russia's case, one of their goals has been to uh, cause dissension in the West, cause chaos in the West writ large. And now you have an actual physical invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we had an invasion of Ukraine back a number of years ago, uh, and now you know a full-fledged invasion. I think one of the things that a lot of people were concerned about, we're still concerned about, is you know Russia, who's very good at these things, using cyber tools to go after critical infrastructure in Ukraine. They did that against the electrical, electrical power grid a few years ago as a test, um, going after uh, command and control and others. We haven't seen as much as it so far as we thought. But I think that's probably coming. And then we're also worried about what Russia might do as an asymmetric threat to go after the U.S. and other allies who are now imposing sanctions and other things on Russia. Because, again, you know, we have a little bit of a soft underbelly belly here where we can be attacked that way. And they could go after a critical infrastructure in the U.S., you know, uh, power grid, financial systems, others. Um, and, and try to disable or at least cause disruption uh, and confusion there. They're certainly also well, very adept in terms of the, the kind of disinformation, but that's a whole other topic. Yeah. I mean, the disinformation isn't necessarily an act of war, but um, from a national security perspective, if Russia did try to um, attack some of our critical infrastructure here in the United States, um, would that be seen as uh, like a kind of military type attack or like what, what would be the consequences of something? Yeah, it could like be. I mean, look, Russians have been good at being under the, you know, a little bit under the threshold. So 
when they've done disruptive activity or when other countries have, it hasn't really risen to that level of an act of war. We haven't seen people dying, and I'm very happy about that. We haven't seen people dying. But you never know, given how dependent we are on these systems, if you take down critical infrastructure, uh, including healthcare systems, that could result in death. And if it, you have a, a big enough cyber attack, you know, just like a physical attack, it could translate into an act of aggression, an act of war. Uh, and I think one of the things we've not done a good job at is making sure that there are there is accountability and consequences for the bad act we've seen. You know, a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, Russia unleashed something called the NotPetya War, which took Maersk, the big shipping giant, really offline, mm -hmm. uh, had major financial effects. We didn't really react too much. We, we said it was Russia, but you're not going to name and shame Russia. You need to do more in terms of bringing costs on them. And we've only really recently done this with respect to Ukraine in terms of going after Putin's assets, his cronies' assets. We have to, ha we have to respond strongly, more strongly to that kind of Russian aggression, too, the cyber kind. Otherwise, we're opening ourselves up to, to more activity. Well, there is some discussion about, um, you know, if you think about digitization and the digitization of sanctions and the ability for them to roll out sanctions in such a wide uh, way so quickly, you know, it is a kind of act of economic, um, uh, you know, at least uh, response. Oh, um, yeah. And, and, and we've been better. I'm glad we're doing the economic sanctions. We are. I think we need to look at that toolkit more generally. I'd also just make a note that our the DHS here, the Department of Homeland Security, their cyber agency within that uh, basically issued a warning a couple of weeks ago saying shields up. You know, if you're a U.S. business, if you're a U.S. entity, worry about what Russia might do in reaction to this conflict. So I think anyone who's listening to this call should think about that and make sure that they're taking the precautions. Moving on from like the immediate situation in the news with Ukraine to the wider situation um, around competition at the nation state level for AI. Um, AI is, in my view, um, the kind of ultimate outcome of digitization because AIs tend to scoop as much information and to process as much information to be successful as possible. And so there is a kind of a wider issue around the nation state level of AI. So I'm, for that, I'm going to turn to Mark. And I want to ask you a very specific question, Mark. Um, do you think that the U.S. needs like a national um, AI strategy to compete in the long run? So thank you very much, Stan, for this question. I think AI is critical for our competitiveness today. I think if nothing else, if everybody recalls what President Putin said years ago, he said whoever controls artificial intelligence will control the world, I will control significant part of, our, yeah, of, um, of the threat um, and ability to deal with uh, complexity and, and major issues. Uh, so AI is very, very important. And, and AI uh, is measured on impact on the global economy. We have right now, Stan, in order to really go into uh, some level of depth, $45, uh, $45 billion uh, is being spent on, uh, has been spent on AI in 2021, last year. Uh, 13 to $19 trillion globally, according to BCG, McKinsey, Deloitte, uh, is the value created by AI globally by major industries, and it becomes a major element of the global economy. Today, if I'm not mistaken, 60% of the global economy is already running uh, on digitalization. AI is a big component. So for the United States, it's critically important to have a national policy working together with the private sector. We are facing, we're under threat, ladies and gentlemen. We had depression, we had Pearl Harbor, we had oil crisis, the Cold War, 9-11 pandemic, now this uh, uh, conventional and unconventional attack by the Russians uh, in Europe. Uh, this is not good. And, and when I, I mentioned this in one publication in The Hill recently, I said, despite all of this the economic ruin, the digital innovators that are popping in different places around the world, this chaos that is going on with different technology solutions, especially with state and stateless mm -hmm. actors, you cannot, um, you cannot discount American spirit and American innovation. Our spirit always comes back and, and we always redefine ourselves. In fact, in Rolling Stone magazine, um, where it's been talked about America unraveling because of digitalization and because how the world treats us. I, uh, and people are saying, are we at the end of the American super security? I think we're not. 
Uh, I think that we are re re shifting our focuses. We are um, uh, we are re transforming now. Uh, and as Satya Nadella mentioned, as I mentioned in the beginning of, we are now seeing massive transformation that our nation has never seen. Something that was done in two years now is done in two months, and this is just really uh, unbelievable. We have, for, for example, data that I will give you. World Economic Forum is predicting the, that by 2025, humans are going to make up only 48% of the workforce. Digital workforce is going to be 52%. So the United States has to act on this. We cannot just say it's negative, negative, negative. We have to figure out how do we humans, um, uh, carbon species, work with, with, um, uh, with, with basically silicon creatures? How do we work together? How do we work with cognitive agents to develop superiority, competitive superiority? We're already seeing this right now. The White House, uh, U.S. Office of Science and Technology, has a fantastic national AI strategy that has been rolled out in Trump administration. Now, under Biden administration, continues great work under Department of Defense uh, uh, J J uh, Joint uh, AI Center, which is building impressive success uh, in the in in the in uh, with the work that they do in implementation. And some of the case studies, they built something called Joint Common Foundation that is being used across the Department of Defense against our intruders and, and many more, you know, protecting our products. So I believe that we're on the track. If we do it properly, we're on the track to we are the number one nation right now in artificial intelligence. No matter what people say, we have more startups. We have more innovation. We have private sector booming in AI. We have the largest enterprises from, from Meta to Amazon to others, continuously innovating. We have our federal energy labs doing fantastically well. China, is, China just is focusing a lot on its national initiatives, but without having this unique uh, innovation footprint that we have. But we have to be reasonable. We have to be re, uh, uh, resilient. We have to focus on agility. And we have to really push all of our energies, private and, uh, private and public sector, together towards this push. But that's my so thinking Mark, on this. Mark, Mark, real quick, just to finish up, then we're going to move on to Mackenzie for another topic. But um, in, in this context of AI, um, there does seem to be a national strategy emer emerging from China. There, um, Prince Mohammed recently announced an Islamic strategy for an Islamic yeah. AI for the, the pan-Islamic world. And the U.S. strategy, and you could argue to some extent the European strategy, has been to really leave it in the hands of companies and the private sector. Do you think that private sector companies can compete at the level of the nation state and, and win? Or do you think that, as I said with my original question, you said there is a national AI strategy, but like we don't necessarily necessarily want government-run AIs, I think, ruling the world either. So where do you find the strike the balance there? I, I think that we have the balance. If you look at Europeans, for them, it's about regulations. It's about social innovation. Uh, it's about focusing on society. Uh, if we focus on uh, the nations which are uh, more run by uh, authoritarian regimes, they focus more on the military use of AI. I think we are striking the right balance. We're striking the balance with the private sector, the private innovation going on with our startups and our companies. And we also are supplementing this with the strategy that I mentioned coming out of the White House Office of Science and Technology uh, and kind of converging those two. So we, yes, we don't have a you know, similar strategy that, that China has a national program and we have a specific fund dedicated to this or, or other countries. But I think you know, this approach of creativity, entrepreneurship, and giving you know, small companies a chance together with the work that DOD is doing, what our federal government is doing, I think gives us much competitive advantage. I think we've been, through, you, uh, uh, we, we've been through a lot of disruptions. We've been through uh, climate change, terrorist activities. And I think by adopting to the digital future what we're doing in this way that we're scaling and increasing you know, our opportunity to uh, br uh, basically build and implement a uh, AI solutions uh, throughout our country in a way which is scalable and addresses the needs of society as well as businesses, it's the right way to do it. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so one of the things you just mentioned is this idea of entrepreneurship and creativity. One of the most creative spaces in the digitization field right now is Web3 
decentralization. And Manisha, um, in a few minutes, I think we're going to get over to you to look at the hopefully the more positive side of all of this. We've had a kind of dark opening between the AI and the cybersecurity. But, you know, as an investor, I know you've always got an optimistic view. So before we get there, though, you know, Mackenzie, you're in the trenches, right? Like you're you're building a company that is the very epitome of, uh, epitome of what Mark just talked about in terms of a Web3 decentralized DAO company. Um, our company is working on DAOs as well. And I think it is a really interesting and exciting part of the tech ecosystem. Can you give us a, a pointer on, like, maybe there is some bright lights here about how the U.S. can be innovative um, in these areas in particular? And what are you guys doing to kind of shine that light? Sure. I don't, I'm going to try to keep it positive. Um, I think that um, in America, we obviously are the leader when it comes to digital platforms like Facebook, Twitter, you know, LinkedIn. Um, these are all centralized Web2 platforms. Um, the, the issue is, is that there isn't a lot of oversight, right, um, with these platforms. Um, these platforms control our data. They basically control our lives. They control what we do. Um, they control our lifestyles um, unknowingly. Um, they do that with very little regulations or oversights. Our governments really don't understand um, technology and this whole digitalization or digital transformation. Um, and so because of that, um, and because of that, I think consumers and users want um, their voice to be heard. And so um, um, they want their power back. Um, they want their power back. And I think that is going to be a, I think decentralization is going to be a, a really big um, a theme um, in the near future of how you users... tell us how decentralization gives the power back to a consumer. Sure. I was just going to say that. Um, so I think that um, uh, users, when they're using these decentralized platforms, they want ownership of their data. Um, so you can use um, a Web3 uh, digital wallet like a MetaMask um, that will end up holding their, um, holding um, uh, eventually their data um, through NFTs and the metadata and also uh, their money, their currency uh, right now. Um, what we've seen with, with Ukraine and uh, Ukraine and Russia situation is that there are some, um, there are some platforms kind of like, um, kick them off or not allowing them to move their money or do or communicate. And um, with decentralization, that hopefully would not be the case. There will be open to, to move money and open to um, do the things that um, they have a, they have human, that's so really can, to human I have a question. Does, does that set up a conflict? Because for instance, this morning, MetaMask and Infura, which are owned by consensus, shut off access to Russians uh, right. to be able to move and use those systems. The 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 decentralized world is in a bit of an uproar about that because the very point of decentralization is that you're not really supposed to be able to do that, but it's revealed that there are choke points. And what's even more interesting is it's turned out that now JP Morgan, they've discovered, actually owns a significant stake of Infura and MetaMask. And so um, suddenly this whole promise of the Web3 and, and the major players in the decentralized world actually have these um, Web2 banks kind of standing behind them, um, somewhat in the shadows. And, you know, at the same time, you have a security issue where, you know, to some extent, there's an argument for sanctions and why Russia shouldn't be able to move money around and use crypto as a loophole. Uh, you guys are right in the middle of that. How, how do you land on that as an answer? Like part of these, uh, we've discussed how crucial these technologies are to America's security and to its prosperity. Is there a loophole in crypto that could kind of come back to um, hurt the, the 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 powers that be, so to speak? Right. So decentral, decentralized um, uh, Web3 is not really decentralized, right? Um, what it's supposed to do, I think the term, the, the definition of decentralization is incorrect. I like to explain it as a removal of the third party. That is not the removal of power or or rules and regulations on on the outside we still have boundaries that we need to play in um so i think that uh, long term or maybe 
well, I guess short term because of this situation with MetaMask, we're going to start to see um, kind of CFI and DeFi kind of merge together into one. There are some aspects with centralized platforms that are positive, and then there are some other aspects with decentralization that's really positive for the greater good of of um, of humanity and mankind. Um, but yes, there you know decentralization is not totally decentralized unless you're really on. Um, using Bitcoin or using smart contracts that are built on top of Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more centralized, and um, and and I think that's probably because of the venture capital that are the venture capitalists that are investing um, in them, and those deals are being done in fiat. So it's kind of oxymoronic, you know, to uh, what we're doing. Kind of doesn't well, make sense right now. Um, thank you. Let's touch for a quick second, McKinsey, on, on DAOs, a decentralized autonomous organization, and the big picture for de uh, digitization in America. Can you just give us a couple sentences on where you see DAOs playing a role in the evolution of the corporate world in America? Right. So I think um, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, or DACs, decentralized autonomous companies, are really going to be like our um, decentralization's um, last like um, bargaining chip, and so with DAOs, you can um, you can organize a community, a company, um, for the purpose of one um, for one um, event, um, one one um, operational event or or goal, like investing in something or um, or or organizing workers to work together, or flexible workers to work together. That's what we're doing at Pro House, um, and you can um, include um, the include all types of stakeholders in the decision making process. Give them economic ownership. You can also um, allow them to do, or distribute the power. So um, it's not the boardroom few that is making decisions on a company, on what a company does. Um, in corporations, you have the boardroom, you have shareholders, and those are the people that are making the, the decisions at the end of the day. But there's a lot of other stakeholders that are, are whose voices are not being heard. And for me, that's how I would define what, what would be the best benefit of DAOs and how, how I see them being used in the future. It is to really navigate stakeholder capital and to um, break down some of these walls between these different groups that are siloed. Uh, they've been siloed over time and silenced um, over time. And I think that is um, it, this is a decentralization of human capital. Thank you. Um, speaking of capital, let's go to Manish now. You know, Manish, at the beginning of your um, talk at, uh, at the top of the hour, you mentioned that you're doing deep tech. And I think a lot of people hear that word but they don't necessarily know what deep tech means. And so coming from an expert who has so much background and depth in this area, can you give us like a quick run through of where deep tech is right now and what the implications are for the U.S.? And then I'd really like to go into a little bit more on the healthcare with you. Sure. So first of all, thanks for having me on. And I think it's a, uh, let me define deep tech, frontier tech. There's all these terms that are used, but really I think the simplest way to think about it is if you think historically, you go back, um, let's say, 150 years, it was really, in a way, the age of Adam, and you saw a lot of development there in, in atomic and physics, and that was translating to value that converted to the age of bits, if you will, uh, in the second half of last century, where you started seeing compute really starting to take off, and the combination of transistors is the perfect example of a combination of atoms and bits to create bits and, and, and go on. So and then the beginning, end of last century and the beginning of this, you really saw the focus moved towards genes, right? You saw this, this push towards genes and you could see that happening in CRISPR, arguably one of the biggest advances of the first half of this century um, was a reflection of that. What we're seeing now is, I think, the most interesting spot to be in because now there is, while there's continuous innovation in each of those domains, I mean, you can see that in machine learning, massive innovation taking place, so you just think of that in the bit bucket. It's in, but there's real beautiful stuff happening at the intersections. And that's where the excitement is, for me at least, is. And that's there's deep tech in each of these bundles. And then there's deep techs at these intersections. So ML-driven um, materials discovery, ML-driven pharma discovery. It's, it's changing the world, 
right? It really is transforming how things happen. Uh, if you go to, um, you know, quantum communication, quantum sensing, you can start seeing real changes. We can sing, look at single neuron activation now. We couldn't do that without ML-driven material discovery, which enables us to discover new materials that, that now allow us to do so. You see this intersection that's happening. And for us, that's what's exciting. Yep. And yeah. Yeah, it seems like there's like a real feedback loop happening between, you know, Mark mentioned this idea of the silicon and the um, bio, the carbon uh, entities sort of working together. But you, you're re really talking about almost merging these two into feedback loops that we can yep. use to progress. Yeah, yeah. And, and and in fact, this is where, to me, this is where I see real excitement. Having spent the last 15 years, pretty much each thing we've created, I mean, take Siri as an example, was in one of those buckets, right? It was in the bits bucket. Now I'm I'm not thinking about in those buckets, although there are some amazing innovations happening in each of those buckets. Too. Don't get me wrong, continuous innovations. But th there's a lot of fun at that intersection. And that's where we're, we, we think the game is now. Okay, that's so interesting. Um, can, can we dive into healthcare for a second? You know, the U.S. is kind of an oxymoron. On one hand, it probably has the best healthcare, healthcare system in the world. Um, on the other hand, it's extremely expensive and many people are shut out of it. And, you know, it's a constant political fight about where the balance is between what is normalized, socialized um, human right health healthcare and what is, you know, market privilege healthcare. Um, as the, the technology world and digitization moves through, and really I think the pandemic has accelerated this so much. Do you see like an opportunity for us to be able to improve this system? And what are the advances that you're most excited about that you think America has a chance to lead in? So uh, there's a great question. And I think that there's, you know, maybe I'll frame it in a slightly different way. There's a massive need for productivity improvement in healthcare. Healthcare is very poor on productivity. And so in the past, nobody cared so much because there was a great market and there was a growing availability of people to solve that productivity problem. That pro there aren't more people to solve this. And I mean, COVID highlighted it very, very clearly, uh, but it was happening even prior to COVID. Uh, there was a massive shortage. You needed to have much better productivity solutions. Healthcare was only 1% automated in 2018, the least automated industry in the world, right? And, and you now start seeing maybe it's 5% automated at this point, 4%. So you're, you need to do that. What am I most excited about? Let's just give a simple example. Let's just take Stanford or Harvard or, or Johns Hopkins. If you have a pediatric ailment today, there's not enough data, even in one of these mega hospitals, to actually run proper machine learning algorithms at a way to get the results you want. But there's a great opportunities now, for example, to say, okay, there's all these new techniques in ML, such as federated learning, such as, you know, appropriate encryption approaches. Now I can say, hey, I want to run this query across multiple hospitals and run out, figure out what's the best next step for this very rare pediatric condition that there's not enough data. We're seeing hospitals go from, oh, we have to have ML, we need to figure it out, to saying we actually need to share and we need to think through the data. And, and you had asked earlier, you know, the difference between China and us. I actually think we have different environments and ecosystems and some of these lend really well to us. We have, we have more siloed data sets in, some, in healthcare for sure than China does. But let's figure out federated learning. Let's figure out a great way to do this. It also goes hand in hand with the decentralization. We, we're not trying to create a centralized repository. We're trying to figure out how best to run. So healthcare is seeing quite a few changes as a result of that sort of innovation. And looping back to Chris on the cybersecurity front, that decentralization and not having everything in one place is potentially um, a strategic advantage for um, attack vectors, I, I would assume. Um, now, before we, we just have about 11 minutes left and I see the Keith and Kirsten and Jerry are in the room. If you guys have a comment or a question you'd like to put into the chat, we'll try and get it over to the panelists. Um, and I'd love, you know, for the last 10 minutes, let's have the panelists ask each other a question. There's so many great comments that came up in all this. Chris, do you have a question for any of the other three? Yeah, I do. Well, first, I, I just want to say one other thing, which is, you know, my current role is helping with worldwide capacity building and cybersecurity issues for governments, for private sector, for civil society. And I think we have to think about that, too, not just the U.S., but how do we leverage this around the rest of the world, both the technology and also the preventative stuff? I, I guess my, I have, I have 
my, I guess my question would be for Manish, which is, you know, I agree with you that federated approach makes sense. Try to get that better data together makes sense. But Europe and others have become very restrictive in terms of how data is shared. Uh, you know, things like the uh, Data Protection Act. How, how do you how do you overcome that as the U.S. is struggling with what its data privacy law should be that will allow innovation, but at the same time help with personal privacy? It's a great question. There isn't an easy or simple answer to that question. Uh, I What I do know is that some great companies, for example, uh, taking uh, data for UCSF and creating I, it's not the appropriate technical use of the word, but I'd use it uh, lossless synthetic data. So data where, which is truly synthetic cannot be traced back yet. You can still do find the patterns for rare disorders. So th- this, this innovation is already happening. And this is why I go back to each environment creates its own unique needs for innovation. This may not be required in China in any significant way, but is really required oh here. <laughs> and, and that's one of the ways people are trying to do it. I think it's a non-trivial question to be transformed. If you look at the IT architecture of a hospital, you will shudder. There's so many vectors of, of, of infiltration that from a cybersecurity point of view, it actually is a true nightmare circumstance. Yeah, I'd say the, the former president of Estonia likes to say that he worry, what the, he worries most about is the integrity attack. He, he, you know, a denial of service attack or other kind of attack is fine. But if you get into a hospital and change your blood type, so you die the next time you get a transfusion, that's a bigger deal. So, I... um, Mackenzie, uh, how do you see the world of decentralization affecting Mark's world of AI? Well, I think his world is going to affect our world <laughs> more than we affect him. I mean, we need AI. Um, uh, I think that um, a lot of the stuff that's going to be happening is um, going to be, you know, AI is going to be used a lot. Um, and that's even with like tokenization and um, and decentralized finance, investing, uh, staking, um, yield farming, all of that's going to be all, all, all automated. So every, your, your investment portfolio will be automated. Um, and so we're really built on the backs of AI. I think decentralization and blockchain really w- w- is um, will be built on top of AI. It's um, pretty amazing because, you know, right now, if you're holding a, a stable coin like USDC, you can stake it and earn five to seven percent yield um, when the banks are paying zero to maybe a half a percent yield. Um, and then the AI systems, which are staking these these coins, are basically looking at the market making of the liquidity of markets to be able to to determine these yields. So, like when a new coin enters, especially in the DAO world, you can have very very high incentives. You know, earn a five hundred percent or a thousand percent to provide liquidity into the pools to enable a project to operate. And then, as it becomes wider and the market responds to that, you know, the the yields will drop over time. So, I, I do think you're right. There is a kind of almost a meta machine emerging out of the the crypto world, and you know. Even Ethereum talks about this idea of an, um, a virtual machine, and they, they don't think of themselves just as a currency. They right. see themselves as a distributed machine. Um, I was talking to somebody a while ago who said that they think eventually all governments will become EVMs. And I wonder if Mark or, or Mackenzie, do you guys agree with that? Like for a government to compete over the next, say, 30 years, will they have to have their own EVM? I, I agree. I think that um, just for monitoring what's going on um, in their um, in their cities or their states um, is great for that. Um, you can see, um, you know, businesses that have their own coin or um, citizens that have their own coin can like tap in or connect with um, connect with cities EVNs. Um, uh, my hope is that. Um, that these cities um, that have their own EVM can actually tap into the Fed coin. I'm very pro Fed coin, but um, can tap into the Fed coin and um, and where um, where financial resources are are, are kind of automated. 
Um, you know, there was a there was a meeting with the Federal Reserve in 22 central banks that happened back in 2018, where they were discussing the concept of a Fed coin. And one of the problems with the Fed coin is that the the consensus is that it would cause a run on the banks because if you can get your coin directly from the Fed, um, why go to a bank? And so the, there are some like considerations about whether or not a Fed coin would obliterate part of the um, the banking system. But that's a, that's a question for another day. I, I want to, if that's okay with you, uh, Stan, just to take a few minutes, I think an important topic that I would list, at least I would like the audience to understand uh, on social responsibility and AI, and maybe okay. to cover this in a few minutes that we have. Uh, it is a crucial topic. Uh, you see what's going on now. now we have extreme mm-hmm. weather events. We have, we just ongoing pandemic shortages, supply chain shortages, Shipping costs are rising, uh, sheet metal, computer chips possibly up in the air, constraints of raw supply coming from China, semiconductor issues on one side. So this is a kind of an interesting situation now, uh, 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 evolving now, uh, uh, almost a perfect storm. At the same time, you have the largest companies in the United States, uh, Apple, uh, Alphabet, Microsoft, Meta, and others basically affecting everything that we do, 24-hour cycle, seven days a week. They know what we purchase. They know where where we have been. They're everywhere. They're anywhere. Uh, They know everything about us. They accumulate massive amount of data. They generate trillions of dollars. Uh, They have massive trillion-dollar market valuations. They control many things that we do, and they have the best and the brightest that work for them in their particular companies. So when you look at all of those things, the, the things that are developing, what they control in, you know, that they have massive amount of money and, and do they have responsibility and who has responsibility for social, social responsibility around us when it's a critical part of AI and technology infrastructure. And I'm concerned, um, me and many others, we're concerned that if they, are, if they have all of this, what do they do with this? Do they actually focus the energy on not not just bringing connectivity and innovative technology and and giving us con- and, and getting us connected and helping us but what do they do to make sure that we're getting a positive customer experience making sure that our experience is ethical making sure that our algorithms that they're used are unchecked make sure that data is not biased make sure that we eliminate bias completely so Mark, and institute the responsible ai and, so and Mark, do, what's your answer do to we, that? Uh, do we focus on? So my answer to this is maybe we focus on social innovation funds. We set up some sort of a fund structure with local, state, federal government, and private sector to make a positive contribution. Maybe we address something what Europe is doing with GDRP with this type of a model where something has to be regulated. You have companies going out of control, monolithic control over the United States. Maybe we focus on collaboration where we're collaborating, as we mentioned in the beginning, with NGOs and private sector together with technology and developing governance. Bottom line is we cannot afford to have disproportional impact on specific communities. Communities of color are being impacted. You know, other minorities are being impacted by the largest technology companies. So AI in this particular case has to have a limit and has to have a focus on social responsibility. I think that I think that there's a lot in that. And unfortunately, the U.S. does not operate in a vacuum or a silo. So it's actually up against a bunch of other places that are uh, just as focused on trying to uh, control this, whether it's for their own people or people beyond their, their own borders. Just for the last moment or two, I'd like to hear again from Chris and from Manish. Um, Manish, I'd like you to just give us a one minute view of like the United States in 2030. Um, from a digitization standpoint, you know, the topic of this conversation. And then, Chris, the last minute uh, with you on what do we need to do to shore up our defenses to make sure we can get to Manisha's vision? So I'd say quickly, one, I think there will be a little lot more federated, a lot more decentralization. All of those will be the backbone that will enable a, a safer, stronger aggregate AI ML approach. And the number one change I see happening between now and 2030 is on the medical side, which is we will truly start having personalized medicine. I think we couldn't do that until we had the systems to enable the determination of personalization. And that's possible now or beginning to be possible now. So that's a big change. And it's a very, very positive change for all of us. So I'll, I'll keep it brief and turn it over to Chris in the last. The longer, time. healthier lives. <laughs> okay, that's, yeah, that's certainly, certainly I endorse that, and I'd say to get there, 
you know, I, I think it's really a recognition that cybersecurity is part and parcel of that innovation, and that growth we want to see, that it is a real no kidding national security, economic security, human rights priority uh, for us. Not some not some boutique issue that only technocrats understand, but that this is really a core thing. Uh, and I think we're getting there. But I think it's also to get there, you need to bring the kind of the innovation and economic community and the technical community and the cybersecurity community who are all very different and have different ways of speaking about things together and talking to each other to actually achieve the same end. Okay. And we're with that, we're out of time. Uh, for everybody on the panel, I'm Stan Stoniker with Hub Culture. We're talking about the digitization of America and its future, covering cybersecurity, uh, AI, decentralization, and deep tech particularly with regard to its impact on our own personal health. Thank you for, to our wonderful panel for this uh, session. It's been really great. You can watch more of the Horasis sessions online. And um, I suppose uh, in the, the great mind of the internet, which um, is probably half sentient by now. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.